So, so my name is Jennifer. I'm from Shanti Deva Center. Uh, good to see many friends and uh, new friends and old friends here today. I'll be moderating our event. And we're here to better understand the, the nuances of racism against Asian Americans and how the Buddhist teachings could uh, shine a light to help us heal and address it. And huge thanks to our speakers, Venerable uh, Lozang Tendral, Emily Su, Sujata Baliga, and Tenzin Wooden for coming and being so open today with your own personal experiences and reflections on anti-Asian racism and how we can create more positive outcomes. Uh, thank you to our 16 co-sponsoring organizations for hosting the event. And thank you to Lauren Ladner for initiating this event as an ally of Asian Americans and an ally of all beings to bring more wisdom and compassion into our lives. So first, we'll have a chance to listen to the personal stories and reflections of our four speakers today. And then we'll explore more deeply, how can we use our understanding and practice of the Dharma to heal and start ending discrimination. And uh, while giving space to our speakers, we'd also like for this to be an interactive session. So if you have a question at any time, feel free to share them in the chat area, or you can raise your hand using the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window, if you'd like to request the mic. And there will be various times in our agenda for Q&A. And we encourage a step up, step back approach. And that means if you've already shared a question or thought, consider stepping back to give time for others. And if you're feeling a little shy, feel free to step up and share because we are amongst friends here. And before passing things over to our speakers, I just wanted to share the story of Taradaka Uno. Some of you may have heard of him, uh, maybe not. He is a jazz pianist in uh, New York, a Japanese American jazz pianist who experienced a, a difficult incident uh, last year. So basically he was exiting the subway one evening to head home to his wife and baby. And a group of teachers came, uh, teenagers came up to him and started punching him in the face. And they said, beat him up, beat the Chinese mother effer up. And he ran, but the teens ambushed him and continued to beat him to the point where they broke his collarbone and he needed to be rushed to the ER for an operation. And he couldn't work anymore to support his family. And he developed PTSD, very understandable. And the question was, was this a hate crime? Well, like many attacks against Asians, there was some ambiguity. The police did not classify this as a hate crime and Uno isn't sure, but he said that as people reached out to him, he was surprised by the number of Asians who told him they had experienced similar things. On the other hand, this deeply painful experience also became fertile ground for compassion. A friend started a GoFundMe campaign with a goal of raising $25,000 to support his family. As of today, people around the world have donated over $300,000. And a group of 45 musicians held a benefit concert on his behalf. So Uno's story is also one of hope. And today he's starting to play music with some pain and a recovery process but he is back on his uh, piano seat. He's been deeply moved by the outpouring of support. And he said, even during painful and unsettling times, we can resist, quote, the forces of discrimination and violence. And I feel more than ever that it is my mission to transform negative energy into something positive and make meaning from tragedy. And so on that note, Perhaps we can set a motivation for our time together, because as Lama Yishi says, everything exists on the tip of a wish. So may we keep an open mind and an open heart, watching our minds as we hear and engage in this difficult subject. May we try to have compassion for everyone, those who experience racism and suffering, those who cause it, out of ignorance and compassion for ourselves. And also through our collective time, may we contribute to a world 
that is able to heal racism and one day even eradicate racism for all beings. And maybe we can take a moment with whatever words or thoughts come to you to set a personal intention for our time together. And may we also hold in our hearts those who have experienced racism and sending positive energy to them as well. And with that, I'm gonna start by passing things over to Ani Tendrol. Uh, she's an ordained nun, board member of Guya Samaja Center and teacher at DNKL. And she'll uh, begin our discussion by helping us better understand the history of anti-Asian racism in America. Anila? Thank you, Jennifer, for your beautiful and inspiring introduction. Um, so the China virus, Kung flu, and other virulent anti-Asian rhetoric related to the pandemic can be traced to a long history of hatred towards Asians in the West. While on the one hand, Asians are considered to be the model minority, at the same time, there's an underlying sense that we're a threat, that we're still not truly American, and that we compete for white Americans, for jobs, entrance to Ivy League schools, and other treasured resources. The recent attacks on Asians have hit close to home. I bought five personal safety alarms one for my 88-year-old mother in New York City, one for her Tibetan caregiver, one for my 18-year-old niece, one for my Japanese sister-in-law, and one for myself. If no one will come to our assistance if we're assaulted, I figured at least we can make lots of noise. Whereas in the past, I would happily wear my nun's robes wherever I went, despite my mom's concern for my safety, now I'm more likely to wear lay clothes. My mom has always said that it's better to blend in as much as possible. In her 68 years of living in America, that's been her way of surviving. She came to the US as a college student in the early 1950s, wearing her elegant Chinese dresses. With the end of World War II, the US became more accepting of Asians and welcomed students and professionals. The Japanese were no longer the yellow peril, the tragic internment of over 120,000 Japanese Americans, Canadians and Peruvians, had finally ended. As a result of facing a common enemy during years of war, attitudes towards immigrants from China, the Philippines, Korea, and South Asia softened. Now they were praised for upholding traditional American conservative values, such as strong families and the ability to do hard work. Now this transition in stereotypes happened relatively quickly because just decades earlier, Western capitalists seeking cheap labor tricked and even kidnapped thousands of men from China, Japan, and South Asia, and shipped them to work in slave-like conditions on sugar plantations in many countries throughout Latin America, with the majority landing in Cuba and Hawaii. Resentment and hatred towards these immigrants intensified over the years as they arrived on the West Coast in Canada, for white workers, Asian immigrants were a threat because they were paid less. They were given the most dangerous, dirtiest jobs, whether in the sawmills and the fields, the canneries, the mines, and the railroads. During the gold rush in California, Chinese miners were robbed and killed. A group of Chinese miners was tied together by their long braids and beaten by a band of whites until they revealed where they had hidden their gold. Through the end of the 19th century, Asians were systematically harassed and expelled from towns across the West. For example, in 1907, a thousand white union supporters yelling, drive out the Hindus, went door to door, pulling people from their beds in the middle of the night, chasing them out of Bellingham, Washington. Structural racism controlled every aspect of Asian American lives. A Filipino writer expressed his frustration saying that landlords wouldn't rent him a room, barber shops wouldn't cut his hair, employers wouldn't hire him, and restaurants wouldn't serve him. Some men managed to buy homes despite strict land ownership rules, only to be driven out by angry white neighbors. Lumped together as inassimilable aliens, Asian Americans 
face discrimination, not only in the US, or actually I should just say Asians, but in Canada, Latin America, and Europe as well. It's important to understand the history of anti-Asian attitudes and how and why they've shifted over time. Since the beginning of the 19th century, it's clear that we as Asian Americans have had to prove over and over again that we are Americans, while at the same time maintaining our ties with our ancestral traditions, language, and culture. As a second generation Chinese American, um, I was the only Asian at a private school in Manhattan. I struggled with questions of identity. My single lidded eyes and stubby eyelashes and flat chest meant that I was quite the opposite of the voluptuous, blonde haired, blue eyed girls that graced the cover of popular teen magazines. My dad, who graduated from Harvard Medical School in the mid 50s, went to pick me up at a party on Park Avenue and was asked to take the service elevator. Uh, later, I spent time in Taiwan and China seeking my roots. However, I was considered an overseas Chinese, which is like a second class Chinese person, <laughs> or even worse, a banana, white on the inside, yellow on the outside. A recent NBC article highlights Asian anti-Asian attacks, uh, specifically on Olympic athletes. And um, the artistic gymnast, Yul Moldauer, who is now 24 years old and is from South Korea, um, and adopted by American parents, explained his sense of what it means to be American. He said a woman cut him off while driving, and when they stopped at the next red light, she screamed at him, go back to China. When people question his identity, he said, his dedication to his, his, his sport is what makes him feel American. I feel like me going to the gym seven hours a day is one of the most American things, to grind your heart out every single day to get an opportunity to wear USA on your chest, he said. Sadly, attacks on Asians have become increasingly common. Stop AAPI Hate, a national coalition that gathers data on racially motivated attacks, received over 9,000 reports between March 2020 and this June. One reason for the attacks may be that Asian Americans, today's, and Asian Americans today are being used as a tool against other racial minorities, just as we were in the past. The myth of the model minority started in the 1950s and became increasingly accepted. The civil rights movement calls for systematic change and government programs to end discrimination, but the success of the Asian American community is used as a counterexample to delegitimize these claims. My mother always says that by working hard and being docile and quiet, everyone can still attain the American dream. If your dad and I came to America as penniless immigrants and succeeded, why can't anybody? He overlooks the unique challenges faced by Blacks and other minorities. And in actuality, Asian Americans continue to face discrimination in housing and employment and, and the, social, the social arena. So the myth of the model minority relies on the success of a very select group of Asian Americans that's been generalized to represent the success of all Asian Americans. But in actuality, a more diverse group of immigrants has come to, the, to America. And as such, Asian Americans can be found at both ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, the highly visible, very wealthy professionals, and also the invisible underground economy. So to deny or overlook the existence of this large population of silent, unseen Asian Americans is a form of structural racism. If cultural appropriation is a form of racism in some sense, then the way in which Buddhism, ex Buddhism exists in the US is a good example. Buddhism was first brought to the Amer Americas by Chinese, Japanese, and Korean immigrants in the 19th century, and it's continued to flourish and expand as Vietnamese and other Southeast Asian immigrants and Tibetans have shared their rich, profound Buddhist traditions. The erroneous claim that Buddhism was brought to the US by white students in the 60s from the East is a form of cultural appropriation. This mindset has indirectly led to the formation of Western Dharma centers where Asian Americans often feel unwelcome and ill at ease. To wrap up on a more positive note, US Olympic karate athlete, Sakura Kokumai, said that a man yelled racial slurs like Chinese disgusting when she was training in a park in, a park in California. She felt angry, frustrated, confused, and scared, but it motivated her to keep going. She says, as athletes, we always tend to use whatever obstacle, make that into strength and power, and just keep moving. 
that sounds kind of similar to the Buddhist mind training advice, doesn't it? So let's each and every one of us, regardless of our background, by learning from the past, forge a brighter, more equitable future for the well being of all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anila. I saw a lot of nodding heads and sort of surprised sad faces as well and really appreciate that overview and the nuances of what has been happening for Asian Americans across time. So thank you. Um, now we're going to, and once again, if thoughts or questions come to mind at any time, um, feel free to type them in the chat area. Uh, but we're going to next hear from Emily Sue. Uh, many of you know her, she's a teacher at numerous Dharma centers, uh, who is also engaged in many meditation retreats uh, and studies on topics such as emptiness. So Emily, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Ani Tendril. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, for that the beautiful introduction and the, the excellent history. So, you know, my name is Emily. I'm here in Aptos, California, which is the unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking Ubi tribe of indigenous people. And I'm really glad to be here with you all today. I thought that I would begin by talking a little bit about what race is and its history, and then move on to sharing some of my own personal experiences with racial discrimination. All right, so I thought to begin by addressing a notion that we sometimes hear that race is just the label as a way to dismiss issues on race and racism as unimportant. But this view is missing some vital elements within the Buddhist teachings on emptiness. Yes, race is a label, it's assigned to us, it's a mental construct, and it exists conventionally. It functions and it has effects. It exists conventionally, it functions and it has effects. And its effects can too often be devastating. And as His Holiness the Dalai Lama often teaches, if our understanding of emptiness interferes with our understanding of cause and effect, then it's better to set aside the ten teachings on emptiness for the time being. He says, understanding emptiness must include the cause and effect of actions. Okay, so what is the function of race? And what are its effects? So race functions to separate people into different categories or groups based on how we look and our ancestral origins. And this can be useful in certain circumstances. And race has been used since the origins of this country in profoundly harmful ways. The concept of whiteness was invented in order to preserve the power and resources of the European settlers of this land who made up the ruling class. And its boundaries shifted over time to support this aim. Those labeled white were deemed as ideal and the supreme and the standard, while other racial groups as less than, less important, less valuable, less competent, and even less American and less human in order to subjugate and justify discrimination and even brutality against people of color. So an unspoken social hierarchy of human value was established here with whites on top and all other groups underneath. And systems, laws, structures, and policies were put in place to reinforce that hierarchy, to support it, to maintain it, giving whites and especially white men many rights and privileges while denying them to people of color and others, as we have heard. To keep people of color in their place as secondary. And this hierarchy continues today, quietly and implicitly guiding us in the rules of behavior, in who gets to do what, who gets to speak, and who is expected to step back. 
and who is allowed to sit at the table. And it determines who is accorded more respect and receives better service and protection and who is conferred more justice and much, much more. And when this hierarchy is violated or when people are under stress, violence against people of color often occurs as we have seen so starkly since the outset of the pandemic and on so many other occasions. And all of this occurs not due to the reality of the superiority and inferiority of races. The Human Genome Project found that in the 1990s that all humans share 99.9% .9 of the same genes. But this hierarchy continues in order to protect the self-interest and greed of the traditional ruling class in this country. So racism is not merely individual acts of hatred and violence by certain people against people of color, nor are ideas of white centrality and superiority held by only extremists. These notions are baked into this country's structures, into our systems, our laws, and our policies, into our cultural messaging, um, by looking at who holds, by, you know, by what is taught in schools, and how people have generally been, been depicted in movies and in TV shows, by looking at who holds the power and resources in this country. These ideas have been baked into our collective psyches and usually held unconsciously. So racism has had unimaginable negative and harmful effects since the very origins of this country, from subtle to devastating, seen and unseen, beginning with the slaughter of indigenous peoples and the stealing of their land, where they had been living for thousands of years and the kidnapping and enslavement of Africans for the purpose of profit, and the exclusion, imprisonment, and denial of full American status to people of Asian descent and many other non-white racial groups, and innumerable other harmful effects, physical, mental, and emotional, throughout our country's history and continues to this day. But fortunately, neither I nor anyone in my family have been physically attacked during the pandemic. But the shunning has increased. And my friends, some of my friends have been refused service or they've been afraid of walking outside. Um, one hides her face as she walks down the street. And many carry pepper spray when they do walk outside. So what helped me, firstly was genuine, developing genuine heartfelt connections with people who cared about me, who accepted me for who I am, with whom I could share and just be myself, feeling a sense of belonging. And then the Dharma has been invaluable, along with Western psychology and nonviolent communication. Learning to genuinely love and accept myself for who I am and growing to appreciate the richness of my Chinese heritage, if not its politics. And working with my mind and healing my pain and my trauma so that hopefully I don't pass my oppression on to others. And then learning about afflictions and ignorance, which we all have, and the difficulty of managing our emotions and why people harm each other. Right? Because of their stress, because of their pain, and because of their unmet needs, and unmanageable emotions. So I'm working to develop more patience 
more understanding and forgiveness and compassion for we imperfect human beings. While of course not condoning harmful actions and attitudes, but strongly opposing them and thus finding more peace and wholeness. And so my hope is to see young people of Asian descent find the support that I did not have. People with whom they can talk about and help them cope with the increase in bullying that has been occurring. According to Stop Asian Hate, the biggest group of people who have been targeted or by racial hate crimes, or at least the group that's been most reported, has been young people, 17 and younger. So my hope is that we can help them understand that this increase in bullying is because of the afflictions and ignorance of the attackers and helping them to not internalize the op oppression and believing that it's because of something is wrong with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I saw a lot of nodding heads. Uh, I think you were striking at uh, cores that many of us have experienced or, or held or can relate to. Um, thank you for sharing so openly uh, with us, as well as the light, <laughs> the counter to the darkness. Um, moving on, we are going to hear from Sujatha. Uh, so Sujatha is a restorative justice facilitator, uh, MacArthur Fellow, and she looks at justice from the lens of peace instead of punishment, which is a bit rare in our society today. So. Sujata, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, thank you everyone for all of the sharing so much uh, learning already for me and I can feel from everyone else uh, as well. So um, I think um, I think I'll start a little bit with my, my experience uh, because it ties into what drew me to the Dharma. Um, and, um, and it was very much that first noble truth, right? The truth of suffering. Uh, and um, but before going any further for just a moment, I'd love for us to pause, um, maybe just get uh, in touch with our breath. Uh, because for me, I know my breath is my constant friend uh, that reminds me of how I'm doing and is an anchor for, for me both when I'm listening to things that move me deeply and when I'm sharing things. So I'm just gonna take a moment to be with my breath and I encourage folks to join me if you feel so inspired. Thank you everyone. Um, and I think about uh, how connected I feel to what's already been shared. Um, um, and I'm assuming that there are similar experiences, not just amongst Asians, but across um, all, all, all people um, who are listening in, um, what experiences of isolation and um, humiliation uh, that, that people share. Um, and then experiences of oppression, I think that can be very specific uh, to the isms that exist here in the United States, racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera. Uh, and a lot of my experiences really, um, and when I think about the suffering that I experienced personally that brought me to the Dharma, uh, definitely uh, sort of when I first heard this word intersectionality, um, when I think about the multiple uh, marginalizations that I've experienced in my life. Uh, this is the kind of suffering that brought me uh, to looking for answers uh, to how I and others might not suffer. Um, and so uh, resonating again with the things that I've heard, um, and there's so many stories, so I'll try to keep them brief, but um, growing up in rural Pennsylvania in the 1970s and 80s, and my family immigrated uh, to the US, I um, English was not my first language. Uh, trying to fit in in an all white, all Christian town uh, was an impossibility. Uh, we did our best uh, 
you know, my father insisted that I go by the name Sue instead of Sujata. Um, I went to church every week with my friends, even though we were very much um, uh, not Christian. <laughs> and uh, people were not allowed to come into our home. You know, all the Buddhas and gods around our house uh, meant that people were just literally would not come over for play dates. Um, and, um, you know, I was not one for assimilation, even from my childhood. Uh, and uh, my failure to assimilate really resulted in a lot of racial violence uh, directed towards me. Uh, violence was a weekly occurrence in my life, uh, being called the N-word on a near daily basis. Uh, the more I resisted, the more I was tortured. And, um, and it was an extremely painful experience. Uh, I, I think that in some ways, you know, my, the religious discrimination in some ways was more painful. The response from teachers about the violence that I experienced uh, was that if I would just convert to Christianity, um, I'm sure I would fit in better. Um, and that was something that people still said in the 70s and 80s um, in schools. And so, um, you know, but the, uh, there was a lot of um, other suffering that was happening in my home. Um, so uh, I was also suffering uh, from abuse in my home. And it was the... Um, it was actually racism that prevented me from being able to break silence about what was happening, right? So I didn't want my father locked up. I didn't want uh, immigration consequences. I didn't want to be taken away and put with one of those well-intentioned white Christian families who didn't speak my language, eat vegetarian food, uh, practice our religion. And so um, when I think about all of this, um, you know, when people say, what's the worst kind of suffering you experienced? And I can't really parse it out. Um, but what I'm very grateful for was from whatever inclinations were there and uh, ironically or not ironically, um, because I think that my father was passing on his own suffering to us. Um, he also had really great politics in a lot of ways. And so it was his uh, fierceness. When, when, uh, when he came to the United States in the 1950s, uh, it was still during times of severe uh, restrictions on Asian immigration. And, uh, you know, in his original paperwork um, showed him as identifying as African-American. Um, that was not the word that existed back then, um, you, you know, on the on the paperwork. But it was interesting. He was a card carrying member of the NAACP. I think he might have been one of the few Asians who actually was like really um, uh, fiercely anti-racist against African-Americans. And I, I'm so grateful to him, I'm sure, uh, on that front, right, that I am sure uh, that that's a huge part of how I uh, decided to take the abuse that he was uh, harming me with. Um, when he passed away, when I was 16, I channeled all of that into figuring out how to end oppression. Um, and so I, I threw myself into um, activism, um, both around um, uh, anti-racist work as well as uh, domestic violence shelters, ending child sexual abuse, uh, all of these things. And so uh, during that time, um, I, um, you know, and when I started to break silence uh, after he passed away, um, what I suspected was true. People blamed my family's religion and race for the abuse in my home. Um, and so, you know, I've heard this on so many occasions, um, and even to this day, uh, people say, oh, that happens a lot in your community, doesn't it, right? Um, and so I say it happens in everyone's community, actually. Um, so when I was 24 years old, uh, I had uh, done a lot of work in all of these fields, and I had moved to India. Uh, I was working in uh, trying to help my then boyfriend in the field of human trafficking, and I... Um, I had a complete breakdown. All of this unresolved childhood trauma that had been, it is uh, working to uh, help others uh, with very few skills at a very young age was not the way to heal my own trauma. Um, and I had a breakdown and I left to go backpacking by myself to find myself or lose myself or something. And I landed um, luckily in Dharamshala uh, where through a very strange and wonderful and bizarre course of events, I ended up writing a note to his holiness, the Dalai Lama, and it said, anger is killing me, but it motivates my work. How do you work on behalf of abused and oppressed people without anger as the motivating force? And lucky for me, Tenzin Gichi Tetong read that note and um, offered me an hour long audience with his holiness, 
who um, gave me some very specific advice about how to forgive my father and how to continue to work on behalf of abused and oppressed people without anger, without the kind of rage and hatred that was killing me, um, but while honoring the kind of anger um, that is necessary um, to, um, to upend oppression and end it. Um, and so, um, so life took a really positive turn from that point forward. And that doesn't mean that I don't still experience racism and sexism. And particularly when um, this horrible, horrible crime and harm that happened um, in Atlanta um, and, and in Georgia happened, it really reminded me of uh, even until my mid thirties, uh, people assuming uh, when I'm walking back to my car after a work that I'm a sex worker, um, you know, asking me how much, uh, these are, you know, I think, again, beyond microaggressions, like this is stuff that I hear from Asian women all the time that we experience. Um, and um, and I, I want to just briefly touch on in the context of Western Dharma centers, um, the kinds of micro maybe or macro aggressions. I don't not really sure about that word microaggression, because in the moment it feels kind of macro to me. Right. When um, I'm often reduced to my race, when people say, are you from India? And I always am like, oh, God, where are we going to go from here? Um, and then people tend to tell me the story of how dirty India is and how horrible it was to travel there, but how lucky they were that they got to see their guru. Um, and when I would hear about this during the 12 years when I was too broke as a public defender to actually make it home to see my family or get to see my gurus teach uh, in, in India, where the teachings are quite different when it's not attending to a white audience. You know, His Holiness teaches in India, it actually is quite different. Um, and uh, that was really hard. And it's not easy to walk into white Western spaces um, where it's where it's dharma, especially when there's comments made sometimes even by teachers like, I know this part of the teaching feels weird to you. And there's an assumption that the whole audience is Western and it doesn't feel weird to all of us, right? Or, you know, like, Oh, the prostrations. I know that that's culturally uncomfortable for people. And I'm like, well, which people are we talking about all of us? Are we always attending to whiteness? Right. Um, so these kinds of things are hard. Uh, and sometimes they're more extreme. I haven't experienced this so much within the Galug and FPMT centers that I've been in, but other Western Dharma spaces where literally white teachers have um, sort of taken this mantle of freeing the Dharma from the cultural trappings of Asianness. Um, and that, that, that they're somehow uh, helping perfect it by getting to the true core stuff, you know? Um, and I think that this is in some ways, um, you know, the, for this word appropriation and um, it's, it's um, you know, but it does imply that there are these sort of newfangled approaches to the Dharma that are somehow more pure, or accurate. Um, but let me pivot really uh, quickly to how the Dharma has uh, helped me. Um, and, um, so it really helps transform my past and current sufferings into being more beneficial to myself and others uh, in my day jobs in working with um, working to end mass criminalization, other types of harm, racialized mass criminalization. Uh, it feels like if I did not have uh, my dharma practice every day that I wouldn't be able to manage it. Uh, the eight verses of thought transformation are my go-to, uh, especially when I am experiencing racism, uh, sexism, homophobia, any of the isms that I experience uh, in, in meetings. Um, I really, I, I don't think I could really function without uh, having particularly four, five, and six of the <laughs> eight verses of th thought transformation on hand. Um, and, um, and I think... Um, you know, as a public defender during those years, you know, being able to hold uh, this, uh, the humanity of folks who've caused harm and experienced harm, really this beauty of how Emily broke down, you know, the two truths here, uh, that there is these, there are these relative realities and there's this beautiful additional truth that we can transcend all of this. Um, I think that those are some of the things that really keep me, um, able to not be marred by the isms that come my way and uh, strike at the communities that I feel so deeply uh, grateful to and embedded in. Um, so I will stop there. I think it went a little over. Um, and I think Wodenla is next, uh, so I'll pass it on. Thank you, Sujata. And just to introduce Wodenla, um, she is a co-founder of Online Tibetan Education. and. She uh, works to promote and preserve Tibetan Buddhism, language and culture amongst Tibetan youth. So she has quite a different uh, 
take from some of our other speakers on the Asian American experience. Wodenla, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Lauren, for having me here. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for sharing such um, deep and personal experiences. Um, so for me, um, I think my experience with discrimination and racism I'm hearing, I think it, it's similar to most um, Asian Americans. Um, so it came to me in a form of assuming that I'm Chinese and um, people would yell at me, um, you know, yell at me and my family asking us to go back to China or would kindly greet us by saying ni hao or making remarks about how your people foods smell. And um, as a Tibetan, um, whether intentionally or not, it never felt good being assumed as Chinese, um, just knowing that um, our people have been and continue to be oppressed by the Chinese government. Um, however, during those times, I would often recall the term Nyingje in Tibetan or compassion. And uh, this is a word that's so often used in Tibetan language. So it was like Nyingje to them, um, maybe they were having a difficult day or Nyingje that they've only seen so little of the world. Um, so many concepts like that um, of Buddhism, it's so ingrained in the Tibetan culture that um, these would come naturally. Um, Buddhism is almost, uh, it's more of a mindset and a way of living for us, us Tibetans. So um, all of these came really naturally to me. So even though in cases of discrimination, when we would be the victims, in some cases we would um, we, were, we would often perceive it um, with compassion, um, considering all the struggles that maybe the other person might have gone through to do such a thing. And um, overall, like we would always believe that people generally strive to be good, good people. And so these aspects of Buddhism, such as um, compassion and empathy, they've always helped me cope through these instances of, um, of discrimination. Uh, however, Last year, I think I learned a lot um, when Asian hate crimes made headlines day after day. Um, although it was disturbing, I only saw it as something that was happening to Chinese people and something that was happening out there. And um, growing up, I, I didn't feel represented or welcomed in many of the spaces that were for Asians because it mostly consisted of Chinese Asians. And so the term Asian, it always seemed so far from who I saw myself as. Um, however, when we begin hearing that not just Chinese people, but also Korean, Vietnamese and other people of Asian descent were being attacked, um, there was a, a, a sense of fear started to grow in me uh, of my family's well-being as well as my own. And so through this process, I learned that ironically, the perpetrators, they showed that identity, nationality and such, they were all mere labels like Emily was, um, that Emily touched on. And when when anyone who looked Asian enough were being attacked, it no longer mattered what kind of Asian you were. And soon I realized though that whether Asian or not Asian, being attacked just based on what you look like or what identity um, or what you identify as is very wrong at the, at the very human level. And um, it is exactly this attachment to an image of self and an identity that we all carry that um, that I think is the cause of is the cause of discrimination and stems issues like racism, sexism, and uh, and many other isms. And I think it's very important for us to address the root causes because today we'll, we're here talking about discrimination in the form of racism, but tomorrow we might be talking about classism, sexism, and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, realizing this, it has brought me to seeing everyone, including myself, as simply a human and seeing each of us at a human level. And if more people did that without seeing the sufficient layers that we add on to our identity, then I think the world would be less about you and I and more about us. And I think that's what's um, brought me to this session um, to, to you know, discuss more about creating a more inclusive space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wodenla. And thank you to all of our speakers for sharing so openly. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. I really appreciate it. And we're gonna take this time for, uh, before moving on to our next session for uh, questions uh, that you may have had to any of the speakers, general questions that have come up on the theme of racism uh, towards Asian Americans or racism in general, please feel free to type in the chat area or raise your hand using the reactions button or just raise it um, with your video. And then 
we'll work on that. I'll give you a moment to share questions. Dave, I see that you've raised your hand. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Um, first off, I just want to thank all the speakers for their time. Like, this is such a good experience just to like have people within my own community to um, give me advice. So my question is like, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm going through is just like, it fills me with such heartache, but like how to deal with not just racism from like outside people, but from my own family. Cause you know, like we deal with all this kind of thing, like people just like projecting this hatred on us but like when I talk to my family about it they just always tell me like oh just forget about it don't do anything don't get involved that kind of like idea is just I don't know like I guess it's because I'm the younger generation I don't know how to react to that it's just like I want to do something I want to help people I want to get out of the house but like pandemic going on and just I, I see where they're coming from just to be safe because they're you know they're my parents or like their older generation they just want to watch out for me but I just want to do something to help people. But like, I'm just so split on like what to do, you know? So I guess my question is like, with it, when it comes to your own family telling you something that you feel is not right, how do you deal with that? Especially from a Buddhist perspective, because my family's, um, we're Vietnamese and we're like Mahayana, like Buddhism. So it's just like, a lot of it is just like, keep on donating like money, sometimes into like the hundreds. It's crazy. It's just like, mom, what are you doing? This money isn't doing anything to the temple. I respect them, but like, I'd much rather use that money to like pay for therapy or like do something actionable. So I'm just so internally conflicted. Thank you for sharing, Dave. Uh, would any of our hosts and speakers care to uh, offer your perspectives? Um, I guess uh, I, I, I guess there isn't really like a right way to do it, but I think Dave, I see where you're coming from. Like as a younger generation myself, there are oftentimes there are things that my elders do that my parents do that I don't necessarily understand. And I feel like just, I feel like communication with everything is just key, you know, just describing like talking about where you're coming from and then where they're coming from and seeing if there's a middle way that you can you can go about it. Um, because yeah, I think for from a younger generation's point of view, it is like like we want to see action and we want to see logical reasoning behind what what why our elders do what they do. But um, it's oftentimes rooted in in you know in cultural way of doing and just a lot of like the traditional way of doing that. Um, I feel like it's hard to tell them just like don't do this and do it my way. Um, so maybe communication, I'd I'd say, would be the best way. Thank you, Wooden Love. John, I see that you have a uh, your hand raised. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I, I was, the question I was thinking about was, um, I guess there's a preface to it. The question is, um, the preface is that I kind of, you know, uh, agree with what uh, Tenzin Wooden was saying about, you know, a labeling, right? And, and how, you know, in my experience in my life, psychologically, there's this tendency that's very human to discriminate, right? And um, in that discrimination, and I, I just noticed this, you know, looking at historically, um, when I was a, uh, you know, a young boy going to, you know, Catholic uh, parochial school in New Jersey, um, you know, I, I heard for the first time bits of racism. You know, and it was, you know, almost like the uh, the racism of the uh, earlier part of the 20th century, you know, Italians, Irish, you know, um, and, um, you know, so, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, at what point, um, you know, the all, you know, everybody who has experienced this type of discrimination and also been able to observe it in themselves, you know, and knowing that this is, 
something very, you know, without without saying you know, right or wrong, this is something that we do um, when when the discrimination you know gets to the point of anger um, and actually lashing out um, then and beyond, then it becomes harmful. But um, I also you know very much agree with um, um, you know the historical perspective that was given earlier about where we are right now in this country. Um, I just signed to produce, or actually, yeah, to produce a documentary about um, some high school soccer players, a, a high school soccer team made up of Somalis and Mexican immigrants and first generation Somalis and Mexicans. And, and that in a, in a small town in Minnesota, which has traditionally been Scandinavian and German. <laughs> And just so, um, for the sake of time, um, would I guess would the question? So, so the question that I'm getting to is, is you know, is anybody aware of any movement that really speaks to the you know the discrimination uh, across the board, you know, that recognizes this? Um, because you know, because we we, I mean, I think it's great if we can talk about our own experience uh, of being discriminated against, but Ultimately, this you know goes on you know globally every day, and it's ignorance. So, um, so really, I'm mean, just kind of my question is: anybody aware of of a you know of a movement that is really to um, you know to change that aspect that that is really generates this kind of hate and this kind of violence? That was my question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. Yeah. Any any thoughts about? you know, going across races, across different types of discrimination. Sujata. I think historically, um, there have been amazing cross racial uh, approaches to uh, addressing racism and oppression uh, in the United States. Um, I think it's something that actually gets dismissed a lot um, or not seen. When I think about someone like Grace Lee Boggs and her fundamental dedication to ending anti-blackness in this country, um, and that people are having, people have and are having very, very um, honest and real conversations. Um, when I think about in the wake of um, the riots after Rodney King was attacked, when I think about um, what happened there um, with the ways in which different oppressed peoples are pitted against one another, and then the conversations that we don't uh, pay attention that did occur between uh, Koreans and African Americans, right? Where we where we start to have those real conversations. So I, I think that it is actually happening quite a bit, um, but I think that it is also really important for us to look at the ways in which um, racialization and oppression happens in culturally specific ways or in ways that are directed towards specific cultures, because it's not all the same. So for example, um, one of the reasons I think it's valuable to have this conversation about racism against uh, Asian Americans, right? Um, and even that bucket is very broad, right? And I think that, you know, Wooden Law is talking about something very important and specific and different that occurs within the context of uh, oppression that happens to a particular uh, Asian group of people. Um, and I think that um, why I'm, I'm saying this is because certain types uh, of racism get not seen and not understood as coming from a particular set of causes and conditions that may be different than others. While the underlying otherism, uh, otherizing that happens, uh, the ways in which oppression occurs uh, might have similarities. I think it's really important to see the differences, particularly because those differences can be uh, leveraged to cause communities to be pit against one another. So, um, so I think that there, you know, that both things need to happen, right? And that both things have always been happening um, and that there's tons of material that maybe we could send out after this uh, call, um, after this, um, you know, with a follow-up email or something and we could think about maybe different ways in which we can share some of that information. Um, so that would be my, my initial thoughts. Thank you, Sujata. And uh, just a, a Quick thought also is maybe the counter side, because I was thinking about the times where there wasn't a lot of racism in my life or discrimination. And it was because it was a really loving environment where people were focused towards a common goal, whether that's music or what have not. And, uh, you know, I had the fortune to grow up with people where race 
you know, in that context wasn't a big issue. And there were many other unifying factors. So, you know, part of it's also maybe just recognizing our common humanity and focusing on that is something that um, has always uh, led to deep healing uh, within my own mind. Um, Jane, hello. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to unmute. You're, you're unmuted. Hi. Okay. Oh, hi, Jennifer. Long time no see. Um, I was hoping maybe sometime during this uh, talk that people could let white friends of theirs, or you know, people here who are white, uh, sort of give us some ideas of what we can do to be an ally to our Asian friends. I mean, the one thing I could think to do with uh, someone I knew was worried about traveling alone on the train was to offer that I would go and pick her up. You know, that's one thing I could think, but that was it. And I'm like, well, what can be done? What can uh, white allies do um, to be better friends? Thank you for, Thanks. for asking. Yeah, great, great question. Any thoughts on that? Emily, you had sent out earlier via email, I think to just some of us about a potential bystander training that exists. Um, and there are tons of resources out there in the world. I think just starting with uh, educating ourselves um, about what is happening and what's being asked for. Um, but I think on a very personal level, um, I love it when people who I'm actually in deep relationship with me ask me, what do you need? You know, how can I leverage my relative privilege uh, to your benefit at this time of your suffering? Um, I think it's kind of that simple sometimes, but in other ways, I think sometimes there's benefits uh, to, to get to educating ourselves, understanding what the problem is um, and what our role in it is. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, just pop that into the, um, into the, uh, uh, into the chat. Um, you know, and there's, um, there's just a, you know, there's a lot of ways in which we can educate ourselves and then we can actually just ask, what do you need? What happened? Uh, how's this impacting you? Uh, if you feel like sharing it with me, what do you need? Uh, that's often really beneficial to me. Thank you, Sujata. And so sorry, just for the sake of time, we do need to move on uh, to the next piece, but uh, Lucien, thank you for raising your hand. Perhaps we'll have time for your question. Um, but first, now is the time where we're just gonna look at broad questions and what can we do to use Dharma to end and counteract discrimination? And the first one is really positive in terms of focusing on the younger generation. And how can the Dharma be shared with the younger generation uh, to counteract racism? And Woodenla, we'll, we'll hear it from you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, firstly, I feel like with anything, um, especially with the when dealing with the younger generation, I feel like it's a process that cannot be forced. Um, when you're first introducing Buddhism to the younger generation, it's like, you know, I don't think it would work the best if um, if they were forced to attend um, Buddhism sessions. Um, and we've seen that with within the Tibetan community as well. And just like how many of us are here at whatever stage in our life um, that we found the interest in Buddhism, similar, similarly, I think there has to be an interest that has to be sparked or a benefit that, that the youth have to see in studying the Dharma. And um, within the Tibetan community, most of us, we were introduced to Buddhism at a very young age. Um, it's in the way we talk, it's in the examples we give, the daily rituals we perform and the customs we follow. So we've grown up seeing our um, our elders prostrate, pray every day, um, make water offerings every morning and then repeat it all over at nighttime and every, every single day. So um, it's a ritual that we've seen, but many of us, we've not quite known why you know, why we do what we do, why our elders um, do a lot of these rituals. So at Online Tibetan Education, what we do is we try to deconstruct a lot of these old rituals and then address the why. Like, why why do they prostrate? Why do they make offerings? What does it mean to meditate? And what, what's the benefit of meditation? And so um, in addition, with youth facing daily internal struggles at school or work and with friends or even families, um, we host sessions on how to deal with daily life conflicts using Buddhism. And so I think that's a good way to approach the youth um, by 
already seeing what they've experienced and then seeing how Buddhism can kind of um, aid to it and be a tool for them to uh, to address uh, these uh, struggles that they face on a daily basis. Um, and so um, we host, and then we also host a lot of sessions um, and then going into more con complex uh, Buddhism con concepts such as um, emptiness, analytical mindfulness, interdependence. And um, we curate these sessions for the youth by approaching it more from a logical standpoint <clears throat> and using uh, our daily life as examples. And as His Holiness always mentions um, that even, even the Buddha's words, we have to question and analyze it. And, and in doing so, that's how we become the 21st uh, century Buddhist. Um, and I think uh, through Buddhism, like I mentioned, it can be through learning Buddhism, it can be a tool for you to address their daily conflicts, um, but it can also help to see each other at a very human level. And through these basic steps, I think Buddhism can help youth be more of aware of their own um, preconceived notions and biases. And it can also help create a more aware and mindful um, generation. And it might not be so much about countering racism, but more about how not to become one yourself. And because it's not on you to change other people's racist view, but it's on you to change how you react to them. And so uh, that's how we've approached um, kind of our, um, our Buddhism sessions that's geared specifically towards the youth. Mm, that's beautiful, Wudinla, thank you. Really about being the change you wanna see in the world and realizing that we can't control other people, but we could always control our reactions. That is so positive and wonderful. Um, and then Wudinla, it seems like you're doing something that's a little different from uh, what traditional Dharma centers are doing. Did you have any other thoughts around that or anything you wish to add? Sure. Yeah. So, I um, in in most of our sessions, because we gear it to youth all over the world um, and of all background, we we take a lot of um, things into consideration, such as the accessibility of it in terms of the location, um, the language, and then also the type of conversation. And so um, we've hosted we host all of our sessions virtually, and then we take into consideration all the time zones because uh, if we have people joining from India, as well as America, um, it can be you know it can be very different time zones we're dealing with. And um, similarly, we in terms of the type of conversation, we encourage a lot of two way conversation between the um, the instructor and the students because most of the times Buddhism Buddhist teachings can be very one way with a lot of technical content, but um, with the youth, we see that, you know, they want to ask all the whys and they want to know um, a lot of, you know, the logical and the philosophical uh, reasons behind behind why, you know, why we see our parents do this and that. So um, so this is why we, we think that a two-way conversation as well as a debate um, really helps for the youth to be very engaged in in learning more about Buddhist, uh, Buddhism. And likewise, I think if, if Dharma centers want to be more open to people of all ages, as well as all races, I think we really have to take into consideration the time and place. Um, for example, not a lot of Tibetans in the, in the US, I guess, um, would attend a Dharma center teachings on a daily basis. Because if you think of it, a lot of Dharma centers are located in suburban areas whereas um, most of them are located in the cities. So if you wanna, uh, if Dharma centers want to be more inclusive of all races, um, whether Asian, black, or any any other races, I feel like the, the location of these centers should really be taken into consideration as well as the languages. Um, so yeah. Wonderful, thank you, Wodana. And curious if any other speakers have thoughts about uh, helping the younger generation or non-traditional Dharma center uh, formats to counteract racism. I think I just might add that um, my primary center that I attend is the Gyoto Foundation in Richmond, California, again, in an urban setting. Um, where the Tibetan, there's a, a huge Tibetan refugee community here, and it is a very Tibetan centric space. Um, and there is a, there's a palpably different experience that I have uh, when I attend that uh, space than other spaces. 
Um, and with regard to the youth, you know, I think that when I see a lot of Tibetan and other Asian uh, kids, including my own half Asian kid and the other uh, whole bunch of half Asian kids in my life, um, they come and they're very interested. And it relates in some ways to um, who am I? They want to know who they are. Teenagers want to know who they are. And they want to have, they just asked for us to start a little Dharma study group um, uh, that is, that really turns on issues of their own cultural identity. And so um, I'm pretty excited about that. I can't believe they asked us for this. It's pretty thrilling. Um, and uh, it, I, you know, I, I always took Satya to the teachings of my child. Um, and he would sit there when he was little. And then when he started to become a teenager and he didn't want to come, I never forced him. And now, um, uh, you know, that he and his friends are becoming more interested again. It's really about honoring their desire, but it really it does relate to their question of like, who am I? Um, from this very teenagery kind of way. Um, and, um, you know, if we just launch into there's no self and like try to go to all of that stuff, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fly for them. Um, and so it's really around identity and um, not dismissing that um, from some very elevated Buddhist place uh, that feels important. Thank you, Sujata, for noting that. Uh, by the way, if you have questions or you're, you yourselves have ideas of how to promote uh, anti-racism for youth or non-traditional Dharma means, please feel free to speak up or raise your hand. We have a wonderful group here. And you know, perhaps as you think about your questions, uh, Sujata, you brought up an interesting question that sometimes does come up of balancing sort of the identity that we hold, whether it's by race or gender or other constructs with the flip side of, you know, emptiness and just seeing that um, identity as a label, holding it, but not so tightly that we think we are that. So how, how do we balance those two? And do any of our speakers have thoughts on that? Emily. Well, I'll, I'll attempt <laughs> to say something about that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that when we hear the teachings on emptiness, oftentimes we think, oh, well, there's no self at all. And, you know, and there's no, you know, we shouldn't, you know, hang on to any sort of identity, etc. But I think that we need to remember that we do exist conventionally and having a conventional identity is healthy. Right. I mean, knowing who we are and what's important to us, what our you know, ancestral background is, that is all very important. Um, but the problem is when we hang on to some concrete, you know, real essence that's unchanging. Right. And then we make this kind of artificial separation between myself and others as if we are these like concrete separate individuals right so our you know our conventional identity is important it's it's it it's not something concrete right we are changing right we're growing we're you know so we don't have this unchanging identity but we do have a conventional fluid you know impermanent identity and and so making that distinction i don't think i expressed that you know, as clearly as I would have wanted to, but, um, but I think the main point is not negating our conventional identity and not grasp, but not grasping onto it as something so concrete. Very helpful, Emily. Thank you. Any of our other speakers? Yeah, Sujata. I, I thought that was incredibly helpful, Emily. And I think that um, in my experience too, I've noticed when I want to go to ultimate reality as a spiritual bypass for my responsibility. So for example, I have a lot, while I experienced racism in America growing up as a child, uh, as I aged, I realized I had relative race privilege uh, when I moved to places where there were African Americans and other races where I have relative race privilege as a South Asian American in relationship to them, right? It was interesting to see how much less ex racism, direct experiences of racism I experienced when I was in mixed company with people of other races um, 
that do, don't fare as well uh, in the United States as South Asian Americans do, for example, right? And so I could be like, there's no such thing as race, except for I do have relative race privilege in conventional reality. Um, another area is caste, right? There's caste isn't real or there's no such thing as caste, but I have caste privilege. Um, and so I don't wanna use this like ultimate reality that there's no such thing as caste as a way of letting myself off the hook for the privilege that I carry and the work that I need to do uh, to end the scourge of casteism in the world. Right. Um, and at the same time, what I love what you just said, Emily, about this, the reification um, of it, like this clinging to it too tightly, uh, for me, then can end up with this sort of narcissistic self hatred thing where I'm like, oh, I'm the worst person in the world because I have all this privilege. Right. So that's not helpful either. And so being able to balance both of those things, I think, can be, um, but that's the sort of the razor's edge to dance on. It, it exists and I benefit from certain types of privilege, but not over reifying it in a way that then uh, makes it so solid and real that either I buy it, right? And I, I buy the story that I'm higher up on some um, hierarchy um, or beat myself up for, for it. it th none of those things are helpful. Thank you, Sudhata. Yeah, this actually brings us, I think, to our next point, because uh, Sujatha, you had mentioned you know, recognizing your privilege, but not letting that, you know, lead you off the hook for action. And, you know, there has been a movement in Buddhist circles, thankfully, to have compassionate inspired action through social justice and collective action. So from your perspective, what does Buddhist inspired social justice look like? And uh, could you help us understand some of the roots of that? Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, while it was also it was my suffering in part that led me to Buddhism, uh, it was also sort of the social justice place. And it was reading actually Ambedkarji's uh, The Annihilation of Caste um, that first led me to thinking, oh, um, you know, my while well, my family comes from a lineage of uh, Hinduism that prominently displays Buddha, it's interesting, <laughs> long story um, about the uh, Konkan Brahmins and, and our sort of religious um, experience um, uh, being slightly different from maybe other types of Hinduism. Um, I, I did get initially drawn to uh, Buddhist teachings because of the explicit rejection of caste. Um, and so that was really um, a powerful first place to begin uh, with, with it in, when I was 18. Um, and then um, as I started to look to different people who uh, I was beginning to uh, listen to and admire, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh, um, I really saw them as, uh, as beings who were act actively fighting oppression. They were talking about the oppression of their people. They were talking about war and they were talking about um, settler colonialism and they were talking about cultural genocide, right? They were talking about um, capitalist environmental degradation. They're activists. Um, and um, unabashedly so. And so this uh, also was a big draw for me uh, personally. Um, and it was actually through that that I started to uh, become interested in like reading the Bodhicharya Vathara, reading the text. Um, but really that initial connection was through activism. Um, and, um, you know, what I thought also really moved me was the way His Holiness the Dalai Lama as I, as I started to study uh, more and go to as many of his teachings as I possibly could, he often spoke highly of other religions who concerned, concerned themselves with the well-being of others in this lifetime, right? And so um, I think that sometimes, particularly in the Western Dharma context, you know, we talk about these three types of suffering, the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and the suffering of all pervasive conditioning. And we we tend to just jump to like the third type of suffering. We all wanna like jump to the Tantrayana and jump to like, like let's, you know, uh, let's do the type three, right? But the suffering of suffering is real. The suffering of suffering is real. And I think some of us have experienced some of it a lot more during COVID, um, but people are suffering it every day. Um, and in my own work, I think that I got to see it, right? With uh, child sexual abuse with people locked in cages on the basis of their race, uh, uh, people who are innocent serving 27 years in prison, uh, all of these things, um, you know, people whose children were murdered and no one investigates the case, um, 
you know, all of the suffering of suffering really, um, that the Buddha said a lot about that stuff, right? Uh, the Buddha was, um, you know, I don't want to use the word political in the way in which we understand it uh, today in the United States is like choosing a political party. Uh, but but I do think that there was it's like a political act to choose to ordain Dalit people early on. Right. Like choosing to ordain people who did, did not have a caste. Uh, in India, right? Choosing to ordain women. These were political acts. Um, and I, I think that we sometimes gloss over uh, the, the importance of that. And so much of the teachings were about uh, the Buddha engaging with folks who were experiencing active and horrific harm uh, and, uh, and, and rejecting um, uh, elitism and hierarchy and excessive wealth. So, um, uh, you know, in my own experience, um, in my in my expressing my own rage and fury about injustice, I'm often critiqued uh, by some Western Buddhist teachers uh, about uh, not being far enough along the path about being really angry, <laughs> angry. And so it was it was really validating to recently uh, find out that His Holiness a few years ago uh, there's a book called Be Angry, the Dalai Lama on what matters most. And so I think everybody should look up that book. Be angry. Um, and uh, he says, and then this is the cliff, cliff, cliff notes, be angry at the injustice, at oppression, but not at the people who cause the harm, right? You and he literally says we have to maintain our anger, the kind of anger that is born out of compassion. We have to maintain it uh, about this, about the, of the oppression that causes suffering until the cause of the suffering is extinguished. It says this in this book, so you should check it out. Um, and I also think a lot about Thich Nhat Hanh's engaged Buddhism, and particularly this um, this uh, beautiful um, thing that he had created called the Order of Interbeing, and that, that you take these particular vows uh, and the Order of Interbeing, and there's 11 or 12 of them, some number of them, but I'm going to read just a couple of them. Uh, number four in the Order of Interbeing says, do not avoid contact with suffering or close your eyes before suffering. Do not lose awareness of the existence of suffering in the life of the world. Find ways to be with those who are suffering, including personal contacts, visits, images, and sounds. By such means, awaken yourselves and others to the reality of suffering in the world. Uh, and another is, number five is, do not accumulate wealth while millions are hungry. Do not take as the aim of your life, fame, profit, wealth, or sensual pleasure. Live simply and share time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. And uh, the last one of his I'll read right now is, uh, do not use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit or transform your community into a political party. A religious community, however, should take a clear stand against oppression and injustice and should strive to change the situation without engaging in partisan politics. And so I think that I would say there too that it's important to remember that the whole reason we have access to the Prasangika Madhyamaka teachings in the United States uh, is because of oppression. This makes me emotional. The very reason that the teachings came out of Tibet was because of the oppression of the Tibetan people. Right, and so to my mind, um, and this is true of many Asian lineages, right? Uh, that the Dharma is here because of wars that the US has been involved in, right? The people have had to flee their homelands. And in that process, you know, it's either the US's excessive involvement or non-involvement, i.e. Tibet, um, that has led to humanitarian crises that have resulted in the Dharma being here. And so to that end, um, I feel personally indebted to the Tibetan people. The Buddha Dharma was lost to my family lineage in India, right? The Dharma was lost to India and the Tibetans kept, you know, the Nalanda tradition alive. Um, and that is like, um, to me, like uh, there's a personal responsibility there, not just to practicing the teachings myself, but to actually doing something, right? That is a benefit um, because they're tied together. They're inextricably tied together, right? The causes and conditions are there. The, the gratitude has to be, uh, for all of it, um, not just for the good stuff. So, um, um, yeah, so I think I would say that I'm also really excited about the rise of Asian voices um, in uh, the Dharma and the expression of the Dharma here in the West. Um, 
I think that there's a story that we're all hands folded, head bowed, walking 10 feet behind quietly, you know, being grateful <laughs> for being here. And I think that many of our parents, right, ask us change our names, don't speak our languages, et cetera, just fit in um, and don't show that you're different and don't, you know, don't make a big deal about and to be humble about your religion and don't, don't, you don't have to run around and be a teacher and, and also like, there are rules about being a teacher. You can't just announce yourself a Dharma teacher. And so that we, we've kind of gotten, uh, we, we're a little uh, invisible. And I think that it's, um, the invisibilization of Asians is real. And, um, and I think, but I think that there's something really precious that we can offer uh, by returning, uh, to returning a little bit to the front um, in a way that still comports with what the teachings are. Um, and so um, uh, there are a few books that are, um, <laughs> that have been really moving to me around engaged Buddhism and also thinking about Dharma and the law or Buddhism and the law um, and where the roots of um, like particularly the golden yoke uh, by Rebecca Redwood French is a really wonderful book that talks about ancient Tibetan law codes and how the Buddhas is uh, Buddhism is 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 uh, tied in there that I think are really great places to think about um, what might uh, you know justice look like from a Buddhist perspective? It's kind of what I'm um, excited about digging into next. Um, and so I'll um, I'll just say that for now. And so uh, yeah, leave it there. Mm, thank you, Sujata. And uh, feel free, everyone, if you have uh, questions about social justice and uh, Buddhism, feel free to raise your hand, type them in the chat area, and also if our other speakers have any reflections to add to Sujata's perspectives, please feel free to share now. You could give everyone a moment. And as people contemplate, you know, there is a question that, that sometimes comes up and do you think that all Buddhists should be striving to enhance their uh, activities in terms of you know, compassion and action and social justice? Or do you think that certain people have karma for different things? And then some people will be you know, deep meditators and they're benefiting the world and beings and you know, deep ways. And do you think that there is a, a unique path for everybody? Emily. Yeah, so um, your question, Jennifer, you know, brought to mind something that His Holiness the Dalai Lama mentioned in his Mahamudra book, the, right, the, the Gelu Kagyu tradition of Mahamudra. He had a section on um, that spoke to just that, that it was actually really, um, yeah, it really struck me. Um, and he was talking about how he, each of us is different and we need to be honest about who we are and where we are. And there are a very few of us who really have, you know, the dedication and the karma to be an intensive retreat for, you know, for many years. Um, this is my interpretation of what he said. And the rest of us, it's good to practice compassion in action, right? Compassion in our lives. And I thought that that was just very, very helpful for me to look at, you know, <laughs> the reality of, of who I am and what I'm capable of and, uh, and thinking, okay, well, I'm, I don't think I'm, I'm a person who can spend 20 years in retreat. Um, so therefore what I can do is to try to be a, you know, a benefit as best as I can, combined with my own personal practice. Very helpful perspectives. Thank you, Emily, uh, for that. And Lucien, thank you for your patience. I'm going to ask you to unmute. I think you're on. Let's try again. Okay, um, one recent 
I attended this and, and go to the land of the medicine Buddha or listen into Tibetan Buddhism is that I liked um, the Dalai Lama, uh, what is it? The um, ethics for a new millennium, you know, talks about becoming involved in action. And I do, you know, it doesn't matter what, what religion you are, but everybody getting involved. And um, I also um, feel personally, it's important to be involved in your um, broader community, um, the social justice movement, you know, um, I know I've seen people from the, the local um, Sangha, you know, at our Women's Day marches, and it makes me feel really good that, you know, we all, you know, have a, a part of playing for democracy. You know, we have a responsibility to, um, for our country as a whole to be democratic. And I really appreciate this discussion because I am third generation Japanese American and 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 kind of like other people spoke, kind of tired of being the quiet American, the other, the invisible are, are not a person of color when actually like um, that person who talked about the history. Yes, we were the original, um, you know, the Chinese and Japanese were the original, um, well, of course, I don't mean not the, of course, the indigenous people and and the African Americans, but you know, in terms of the many anti-immigrant laws were against the Japan Asian Americans. So I really appreciate um, this discussion because I think this last year um, it's really brought out the voice of Asian Amer Asian Americans, and um, and I've been very much involved in the social justice movement. And I think it's really important to, um, you know, that Asians go out and support Black Lives Matter um, and not, we, we just had this incident in Santa Cruz where there were two, um, you know, white youths that, that destroyed part of our mural that many people were involved in painting this mural on Black Lives Matter. And some people said, oh, it's just boys being boys, but it's really not, it's a hate crime. and. You know, it's it's it was it's really important that um, because they try to have the divide and conquer thing about Asians and and um, Black community, but we really need to show that we have to stand together. You know that that's really really important, and also, um, you know, I am personally getting kind of tired. I was just raising something the other day on my Facebook about the. Commission on Wartime Incarceration about the internment camps. And then this white person said, this one Japanese person said, yes, that's because this post that I put showed this white person that tried to disrupt the hearings and said, oh, you know, the camps were not a bad thing for Japanese and blah, 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 blah. And, and I think it's really important that we um, give credence to the um, history that of discrimination in this country. And so then when you know, I, I tried to bring up the thing about the commission of the wartime incarceration and this this white person who tried to disrupt the hearings, this other white person um, got really mad and said, um, you know, didn't like it when this other Japanese person said that that person was a Karen because, you know, saying Karen is the same thing as using the N word, you know, are using, you know, discriminatory, discriminatory words against Asians. and. I think people really need to dig a lot deeper um, and, and understand the history of African Americans, the indigenous people, and you know, uh, and Asian Americans because we, we're kind of the quiet Americans, and that's why I really appreciated the talk um, that was given, you know, about the long history. So anyway, just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucian. And in a moment, we're going to talk about. Um, how we also can be allies to other races and other uh, yes. minorities, especially in the uh, Buddhist community. Um, and before we do, I just wanted to ask a question to our, to our speakers that came in through text chat. And since race and racism are modern categories, are there Buddhist teachings that are directly related to race? Uh, for instance, Judatha, you gave a good example of caste, but is uh, are there any traditional texts or teachings that are more directly applicable to race and not from the modern era? Do any come to mind? I, 
I, I might just say that it's interesting when I think about new Dharma communities that are uh, people of color centric, calling the Buddha a person of color. I find it interesting because it, it sort of exists, you know, Buddhism existed prior to the conceptualization of people of color, right? The Buddha existed at a time where the Buddha was kind of towards the top of, of a hierarchy um, of caste. I mean, he wasn't a Brahmin, he was Kshatriya, right? But he was still, you know, uh, extremely privileged. And I, I think, um, I, I would suspect no, just because race wasn't a thing that existed in India uh, at the time at which the Buddha lived, right? The Buddha lived at the time at which caste was the thing. Um, there are modern uh, understandings of caste now um, that are, you know, that, that help us understand sort of um, race as being very similar to caste. And so I think that there's a lot of transferable information about uh, caste uh, and race. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we know biologically and, and historically and racially, like caste is a fiction in the same way that race is a fiction, right? Um, and at the same time, I think um, it's really important what Emily raised earlier, that they are real in relative reality and that people suffer uh, on the basis of um, the reification of, of these notions. And so um, my gut tells me no, um, that the Buddha did not talk about race per se, uh, because um, there wasn't that kind of migration uh, at the time of, of Buddha's life. Um, but I think caste leads to, is an extremely useful parallel in understanding um, how it is that we ought to think about it um, and, um, and why this Dalit movement of mass conversions to Buddhism, looking for an indigenous religion uh, that was uh, anti-caste, uh, explicitly anti-caste, um, you know, resulted in these mass um, mass uh, conversions uh, of Dalit people and of higher caste people uh, who came to those uh, uh, higher caste Hindu people uh, who came to those conversions uh, in order to stand in solidarity with um, choosing an indigenous casteless religion. But right? there are many casteless religions that came to India. Right, Islam is casteless uh, without caste. Right, Christianity is without caste. Um, there were other casteless religions. Sikhism is without caste, etc. So, but um, but there's there's I think that's that's a really good place to start is reading up Bedkar's work on caste and Buddhism. Mm. Thank you, Sujata. It's fascinating to even think. Oh yes, that's right. There was a different divide, you know, when the Buddha's teachings originated. Um, and speaking of divides, and speaking about sort of stepping back a bit from the Asian experience. The question is, you know, how can Dharma organizations find better ways to meet the needs of people of color in general and foster a sense of inclusiveness and equality? And I would say probably a lot of Dharma practitioners have recognized that we can do a lot of work in this area. Um, and so, uh, Emily, would you have some reflections on that? All right. Okay. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. So I thought to talk about this topic in relation to a comment that a friend of mine uh, made to me recently. She said that people of color who end up staying in our Dharma organization are comfortable in white spaces. That people of color who end up staying in our Dharma organization are comfortable in white spaces. So is this true? And if it's true, is that what we want? Do we want to be Dharma organizations for primarily white people with a few people of color dotted in? So it's interesting to reflect on why we don't have more people of Asian descent and other people of color in many of our Dharma organizations. And I certainly don't presume to know the answer and no doubt there are many reasons. But I thought today to explore this question from one particular angle in terms of three basic human needs that were identified by psychologist Stacey Haynes. And this, these are the, the need for safety, the need for belonging, and the need for dignity or respect. Safety, belonging and dignity or respect. 
So do people of color feel safe in our Dharma communities? Do they feel a sense of belonging? And do they feel respected and treated as equals? And of course, the Buddha taught the equality of all beings and that we all have a fundamentally pure mind, a pure nature, and each of us has the potential to achieve full awakening. And he encouraged us to develop loving kindness and compassion for each and every being and not to harm anyone. But we all have deeply ingrained tendencies to grasp at ourself, to compare ourselves with others and to judge ourselves as better or worse than others. And if we grew up in this country, we have been bombarded with cultural conditioning, which centers whiteness, which implicitly teaches a relative superiority and inferiority of different races. So we all likely hold attitudes of racial bias, which can manifest in unintentionally disrespectful or exclusionary ways. And I've heard stories of people of color experiencing various types of microaggressions, marginalization, invisibility, and other types of disrespect in our Dharma communities. So how can we foster a greater sense of safety belonging and respect for Asians and Asian Americans and other people of color. So I'm not by any means an expert on this topic and I'm actually shy to talk about it. And some of you may know more than I do, but I'll mention a few ideas based on my reading and talking with others as well as some of my own observations and aspirations. And then later we'll invite you to share your thoughts and ideas regarding this. So firstly, I believe that there's no substitute for having a greater diversity of Dharma teachers and particularly teachers of color from various racial groups and backgrounds who have different lived experiences and perspectives and have personally, who have personally encountered the racial discrimination in this country so that they know these issues viscerally. And as Robin D'Angelo mentioned in her ex excellent white fragility, inequity can occur simply through homogeneity. If I'm not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them, much less be motivated to remove them. So I believe that a greater, having a greater diversity of teachers um, in doing that, we would, a greater diversity of people will see themselves represented. And so my belief is that more teachers of color and more diversity in, in teachers can foster all three of these basic needs, greater safety, belonging, and respect among people of color. Secondly, I would like to see diversity training in our organizations for our teachers, for our staff, for our community members. And I myself would be keen to receive this. You know, as, as mentioned earlier, we have been subject to our country, country's cultural conditioning and we probably all hold unconscious biases. And I believe that diversity training can help bring more awareness into the ways that we can inadvertently marginalize or disrespect people of color and perpetuate racial biases and stereotypes, and also assist in changing our unconscious attitudes and behaviors and help bring more safety and respect to people of color. And then, I also highly recommend reading books on anti-racism. There are so many excellent ones out there these days. You know, I mentioned White Fragility. Also, Isabel Wilkerson's cast is brilliant and beautiful. And then Chen Sing Han's Being the Refuge, Larry Young's 
Awakening Together, Jennifer Eberhardt's Biased. Okay, this is a big list. Um, Paul Kibble's Uprooting Racism. <laughs> All of it, excellent. And I can, I can uh, actually layer, I can put those books in the chat. And then what Dharma teachers can do, I think is to find ways to explicitly and skillfully mention race and racial discrimination and incidents in our classes and meditations, at least, you know, not in a political way, but at least to acknowledge their existence, you know, as types of human suffering. When teaching on for and when teaching on the equality of all beings, we can name name the equality of races as well as the equality of genders and people with different sexual orientations, etc. And we can encourage all everyone to practice inclusiveness and respect toward each and every being, regardless of their race socioeconomic background, sexual preference, et cetera, which I think can assist in better connecting with the experiences of people of color and other marginalized people and help them to feel seen. Because rarely have I heard the term race mentioned in Dharma classes and communities. And this can make people of color feel unseen or that their issues don't matter. In addition, silence on these topics tends to perpetuate the status quo, which is racism. So this event is a welcome change. Another point is that my sense is that nowadays, with the increase in anti-Asian hate crimes, as well as the global and national crises that we're facing, including the pandemic, climate change, you know, racism, economic insecurity, et cetera, that people are needing supportive, comforting, healing spiritual spaces more and more. So perhaps we can supplement the Dharma educational programming, which our centers tend to be very good at, with additional Dharma programming, emphasizing caring, support, and comfort. And so in this vein, as Woden Law mentioned earlier, I think it's useful to supplement traditional unidirectional modes of teaching with more two-way learning, listening to others, asking their experiences, having exercises and breakout groups for discussion and sharing, you know, finding more creative ways of teaching, which I believe can foster a greater sense of connection and community, comfort and belonging for people of color and for everyone. My next point is that I would love to see more programming dedicated for people of color. So not long ago, I attended a Buddhist healing event for people of Asian descent. And I saw the value of having programming reserved for people of color. There was a certain common experience. So people felt seen and validated we could drop our guard and there was no need to explain or educate on racial issues. And so it was safer for people to open up, to discuss these issues and incidents and to share what was going on for them, which provided a supportive and deeply comforting and healing space for each other. So my hope is to see programming reserved for people of color for this purpose. And this could be particularly useful, perhaps for young people and particularly for Asian Americans who are experiencing, or and, and particularly for Asian American young people who are experiencing a sharp rise in bullying. According to Stop Asian Hate, 
the biggest group targeted or reported as being targeted by hate crimes um, among Asian Americans are the group 17 and younger. And I've heard of parents being afraid to send their children to school as a result. So having programming, you know, supportive, comforting, healing programming um, for people of color, um, I think would be very helpful. And this could also include, you know, Dharma discussions, Dharma talks, um, doing practice together, loving kindness, compassion, tonglen. And this could possibly be done on Zoom if multiple centers wanted to co-sponsor it. And I believe that this would foster, help foster all three basic needs, safety, belonging, and respect, as well as community for people of color. And then finally, I know this is a big list, <laughs> um, teaching, like teaching and talking in ways mindful and of the sensitivities and wounding of people of color who have been targets of oppression and often hold racialized pain and even trauma. So we can all take very good care not to re-wound or delegitimize anyone's pain as a friend of mine put it. In the way that we teach and talk about karma, anger as Sujata was mentioning, and cherishing others is more important and holding ourselves as lowest. Being very careful about how we talk about these things. And especially about the teachings on karma. Like not implying that the victims of oppression and abuse are to blame as can sometimes be you know, twisted um, as uh, you know, karma can be twisted as meaning that okay, then the victims are to blame or that they deserve the abuse or using karma to just dismiss it as just their karma. So I believe that we can all contribute to this, to creating more welcoming, inclusive, caring and equitable environments for people of color and for everyone where we all feel safe and respected and feel a sense of belonging. Okay, so those are just a few ideas. Um, some of these things are already being done, which is wonderful. And do we want to do more? So let's open up this up now and invite others to share your thoughts and ideas. And also if you want to, if you have interest in you know, programming, specifically for people of color. Um, yeah, let us know, please. Thank you, Emily. And I'm just going to put a link to a survey uh, and form that Woden has created. So thank you so much for that. And that allows uh, space if you wanna put your email address to let us know if you have interest in future similar types of programming and also to offer your feedback, that would be great. Um, I think for the interest of time, instead of focusing on those ideas right now, maybe we can you know, create the intention that these discussions will evolve. That was a lot of uh, wonderful wisdom, Emily, that you had shared, and I think uh, deserves a, a very close look. And also we're, we're in it together. I mean, I have been so moved by seeing Asians and non-Asians at this meeting today by us, you know, sharing and looking at these issues with a lot of frankness and us thinking about how we can heal discrimination uh, for Asians and for all people, uh, our brothers and sisters who we share our lives with. So, so thank you for that. Um, just wanted to take a moment to once again, thank our speakers for being so open, vulnerable, <laughs> insightful. Thank you again, Lauren, and everyone here. And uh, just to make sure that this, this positive energy isn't wasted, uh, we can dedicate. And uh, Venerable Tendril, would you be so kind to lead us in a dedication of these merits?
This is the uh, the longer version of the four immeasurable prayer. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were to abide in equanimity, free from the discriminating thoughts of anger and attachment that hold some close and others distant. May they abide in equanimity. I myself will cause them to abide in equanimity. Please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and its causes. May they have happiness and its causes. I myself will cause them to have happiness and its causes. Please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were free from suffering and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. I myself will cause them to be from free from suffering and its causes. Please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were never separated from the happiness of higher rebirth and liberation. May they never be separated from these. I myself will cause them never to be separated from these. Please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to do so. Thank you, Anila, and may we together make it happen. May it be so. And on that note, just wishing everyone a wonderful evening and much gratitude for your attention and two hours on a Sunday <laughs> looking at these uh, important matters together and hope to see you again online or in person in the future. Thank you.